It's late August 1978. Sid and Nancy are in New York City and check into the Chelsea Hotel. Sid and Nancy came to New York and I remember seeing them in Max's or maybe it was the end of the summer. Uh, what I had heard from the other guys in the band was that Nancy was so obnoxious they were trying to break them up. They were trying to get Sid to leave Nancy and he wouldn't and he was still with her. And at one point Nancy came with Sid, like John asked Sid to come over and talk and he came over but Nancy was with him and uh, John actually chased her down the street with a hatchet trying to get her to stay away. You know, he, he was torn. One, he didn't have this uh, support network from the Sex Pistols. He had Malcolm trying to manufacture him into something. And he also had these light little children everywhere saying that he was the best thing from side spread. And you had Nancy saying that he was the real star of the Sex Pistols. You know, Whatever he wants to do, he can do it. You know, you know, just take another, just have another fix, and you know, we'll get this sorted out. Um, and that led to him going over to the states and and all of that stuff. It became even in England before they got to America, before the sex pistols broke up. It became that same pattern. There was one interview that I just couldn't even believe that the paper printed it. It was like enemy or sounds. One of the big music papers of the time. It did like a two or three page interview with Sid. And it was all Nancy. And even the photographs were pictures of Nancy sitting there talking and Sid like this. And I suppose they thought it was cool. But she wasn't exactly an idiot. She wasn't dumb. And uh, she had a tough skin, maybe a little psycho maybe. But uh, it's like Sid wasn't really vicious either. <laughs> Okay, when she came back with Sid, I really wasn't close to her anymore because she had her rock star boyfriend and she was occupied with that. And Nancy was uh, mainly convinced that Sid could be a solo rock star. That was, that was her stick. She hadn't been able to land somebody who was already a rock star, so she was busy trying to make him in, into one. Uh, I mean, he was halfway there with the, with the pistols. Most, I think the majority of Americans thought he was the most important person in the Sex Pistols because he got all the publicity when they were doing that, that crazy tour of cowboy clubs and stuff like that. People forget, you know, this kid was only 21 years old. You know, I mean, he was a kid, you know. I mean, you know, he, he was he was a fuck up, obviously, you know, and uh, all of a sudden he was like in the most known band on earth, and he, and he wasn't even a musician. <laughs> he, he was his whole purpose was just, you know, he was a fuck up. It was punk rock. The pistols were were, were, were great, and um, so they don't come. They they break up, and then all of a sudden, you know, Sid's in New York City. You start seeing him around. You start seeing him at all the shows you were going to, and then of course at Max's, and Sid was there, and we're all upstairs hanging out, and uh, upstairs in the dressing rooms, and he was just like another guy. He was like another kid, really. We were all pretty fucking young. He seemed like a little kid that wanted friends, like a lonely guy that wanted friends, and I wanted to be his friend. He'd cut himself for attention. He'd, you know, do the things he did for attention, but the person he was, he was, he, he was a sweetheart. To counter the Sex Pistols' reputation for not giving interviews, bass player Sid Vicious came out to tell reporters a little bit about his personal background. When I was 13, when I was 12, I was just a kid. When I was 13 to 15, I was a skinhead. From 15 to 20, I've been a punk. The 
next time I saw Sid was in the CBGB's and I was bringing in a heavy amp and uh, Sid was always hanging around CBGB's and uh, I remember uh, walking by him, it was crowded and I, I, I stepped on his foot really hard and uh, he was le looking down and I said, oh, sorry Sid and he just looked up and huh? And uh, <laughs> those are the only words I exchanged between uh, Sid Vicious and, and, and I. Nasty Spongeon used to come into the DJ booth and she borrowed $5 from me. I gave her the $5, I never got it back. But she, uh, yeah, she used to come in and go, oh, oh, you know. She'd be like nodding out with her eyes going like, oh, well, I got this, this boyfriend, huh? Can I buy five dollars? I'd reach into my bag and give her five dollars. She'd go, thank you, man. She'd run off, do her thing, whatever it was to do. I'm gonna take the five dollars and get dope, I guess. Uh, my friends and I, we went and got Sid a bunch of two and alls. He didn't feel like walking across the street and getting them, so we did. Just for having colored hair, you'd get attacked. It was very different. And Sid, I mean, my God, people were afraid of him. Even though he was big, he was still like a very vulnerable looking human being and yeah, I mean, maybe he felt threatened. I think, I think a, a lot of people carried knives in those days. I don't think it was uncommon. We were living on the edge. We were approaching violence. We had those knives. We got one for Sid Vicious. Those knives, those 007 knives. They were big. Stiv had one, I had one. I think Blitz may have had one. And I threw mine away that night. Because I thought, who am I kidding walking around the streets with a knife? It's going to end up being used on me, so I got rid of it. Tonight, Chris Borgen has a special report on the violence that increasingly has become part of the rock music business. A friend of mine named Kathy got money from a car accident, and she took a group of us to Manhattan uh, to stay in a hotel for a week. And she had a lot of money, and we were going out every single night. And during that week, we kept running into Sid and Nancy. And Sid happened to be infatuated with my friend Kathy. I always wanted his cock ring belt. So I was always trying to get him to trade his cock ring belt, you know, for something. Nancy had it in her head that, you know, Sid was going to become a famous star out there and that she was going to be his manager and stuff and everything and it would all be hunky-dory. He gathered a really good set of musicians. The band was just fine. Um, it's going to be Sid, Jerry Nolan and Arthur Kane from the Dolls and Stephen Dior from Jerry's new group, The Idols. Okay, so The Idols, my band, Jerry Nolan, Arthur Kane, Steve Dior and me. Jerry had started dating Steve's sister. That's how we got kind of met, you know? Steve's sister Esther was dating Jerry. So then we got with Jerry. So the first, uh, the first Thursday, uh, Sid uh, went over well as far as uh, ticket sales and all that sort of thing. I mean, Nancy was happy. Uh, poor Sid was half dead. He, 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 had, a, he had the flu or, or something similar. Um, uh, with a very high fever. Uh, he spent his time on the, in the dressing room uh, laid out on Tommy's couch, uh, barely able to get up and move, which is why his performances aren't, aren't that great. And uh, Nancy just yelled at him all the time and made him get on stage and, and you know, didn't give him a break. Basically, the, the only uh, interaction I had with Nancy was, was her complaining about things. Well, under Nancy's influence, all he did was get drunk and get stoned. The one time he played at Max's, he couldn't even finish the song. Uh, he would start singing a song and then kind of stumble halfway through the first verse, and Nancy would come out and give him another drink and say, you're doing okay, Sid, you're doing okay, just start the next song. And I remember Mick Jones talking about it and saying he couldn't believe, because Mick Jones actually played guitar for one or two of Sid's solo shows and he couldn't believe that Sid was so out of it and that the show was so poorly you know, planned and so badly done that Sid couldn't even finish a song 
uh, Mick was embarrassed to be in the in the band. On September the seventh, Mick Jones, he was there. He came out and played with them on stage. You just look at you listen to it because uh, Steve Dior had, so he had his idea on a little super group himself, you know, and he had uh, Nolan Arthur Kane himself, and what should have been a really tight little unit, you know, it was shambolic. Yeah, he had that magnetism on stage. He did. I mean, the whole Nancy part of being part of it was kind of weird, but I thought like Steve Dior, uh, you know, Jerry and Arthur, and, um, you know, Mick Jones, I think the one night that I was there. He did his best. He didn't kill himself. He didn't jump up and down or like leap about or try and, he, he just tried to get through and, and he sang and hit some notes. I don't, I can't remember if Nancy sang with him that night or not. And it was just jam because everybody was there to, to see, to see the Sid. But he was just there, he was like, okay, I, I've got a gig and I'll, I'll do what I can. He didn't play, he didn't play bass. Performances of Sid Vicious at Max's were great. Me and Gregory went to two of the shows. Um, I remember the first show we popped a couple of Quaaludes, which basically got us on the same wavelength as everybody else. And things on stage were chaotic, but we didn't mind because we expected that. We were looking for Nancy because she had stolen some of my clothing before she went to London. She had taken um, my jacket, which was kind of a PVC, kind of wet look vampire-y looking thing with testers written on the back. Uh, one day I went to Max's Kansas City, one night I should say, I went to Max's and I saw Nancy uh, going up the stairs and she saw me by little suits and stuff like that and she says, so babe, are you turning Puerto Rican on me? You know, she would have that kind of an attitude and stuff and and she was like all like styled out of the, all the English fashion and stuff like that and she says, come on upstairs and, and meet Sid and, we, I think we shook hands or something like this and, you know. I always would go downstairs and wa watch the beginning of a show and if it was horrible I'd go back to my office. And Basically with the Sid shows I watched a couple songs and I went back to my office. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were impressive, you know. They were energetic and, and crazy and like nothing I'd ever seen before. I had seen Sid in like a keeled over state before, you know, but seeing him on stage, it was like kind of like another one of the guys up there, another one of the kids up there. And, you know, at the end of the day, he was a fucking badass. And then I remember the one day that uh, Stiff got this call from this guy named Michael McKenzie. He phoned uh, Stiff at our room and said, there's this guy, Ephraim Allen, he has this cable TV show. Um, he heard that you and Cynthia and, and Sid and Nancy are like hanging out. Would you be willing to go on and do a live call-in show? And I was like horrified. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. And Sid, you know. But Stiff thought it was a great idea. Nancy thought it was a great idea. Sid and I kind of went along for the ride. I'm his girlfriend and his manager. I have been for two years. Before the show started, Sid was busy watering the, the artificial flowers on the table in front of them. I mean... I like to see Colin stays very heavy. I like to pull out my dick. <laughs> I like to jerk off in front of ladies. So do I, pal. Don't worry about it. Uh, they, was, they were pretty ripped. Uh, but they weren't falling down. They were 
actually pretty articulate. He's playing at Max's on the 20, the weekend of the 29th, and we're playing in Boston on the 24th. And then we had our regular practical jokers calling up with stupid comments and so on. Now there was a rumor that, that those gentlemen and, and their uh, adversary and their group, the members of the group, they were being followed around town by other people with poopy scoopers. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, sir. We have to feed you, don't we? <laughs> It was fabulous, just looking right at me across the whole room. It looks like it's just me and him, and I am across the room in a sea of people. That's what I'm saying. He wasn't dumb. Nancy had a very, uh, a very uh, diabolical attitude about um, the, the finances. You know how money was going to be distributed. You know, and uh, you know I could feel the, the, you know, the dope and the, uh, the control sort of a thing. You know. Now, like, oh, Sid, Sid, and Sid wanted us, was inviting us to come back to the Chelsea for a party later that night. And um, Nancy didn't want a party, she just wants Sid to, to herself, and she got mad and stormed off the curb, and there was a cab coming right then, and I grabbed her right, pulled her back out of the way of the cab. I'd heard Sid Vicious was, was uh, doing a bunch of shows at Max's, and um, I th I think he had done a few already, and I heard, you know, mixed reports about it. So I heard he was playing that night. I was over at CBGB's. I, I wandered over to Max's, and, and uh, I thought it would be packed, but it, it was uh, it was like two thirds empty. very little video of Sid and the only video of Sid is basically him nodding out and falling over and Nancy doing some of the talking but you don't really see much of the real Sid there's one or two videos that were not very you know widely shown in those days in the 80s there was no YouTube there was no internet there was no way to see those videos unless you were in a nightclub or some kind of video show so nobody really had any view of who Sid really was nobody ever saw the actual real Sid Vicious but Gary Oldman made Sid in his movie, and the movie was very popular. And so millions of people have seen Sid Vicious played by Gary Oldham. Gary Oldham is a fantastic actor. He has played some of the most charismatic, 
crazy people. And he played a very charismatic Sid Vicious. He made him very likable and very lovable. And he gave him a personality that I don't know if Sid even had himself. He wasn't that deep. Growing up into music and punk rock in New York, you know, we, we definitely looked up to Sid for some reason of just breaking the ice, of telling people like step away, like going to school with real straight people and being in a middle class suburban neighborhood. It was somebody that was reaching out and it was kind of an expression for yourself to put those records on and say, yeah, I'm doing it my way. Vicious, whose real name is John Simon Ritchie, was arraigned today in Manhattan. Over the objections of the district attorney, bail was set at $50,000. Vicious' former manager arrived today from London and is trying to raise the money. He told newsmen Sid may be an outrageous person, but he is no murderer.